we're going to look at a couple of examples of working with vector value functions and just thinking about inputs and outputs and uh, domain for these different vector valued functions. So you can see here I have two different vector value functions examples written here. One simpler than the other. Um, they're both written in this notation so that we can see that the input is t, so a real number, and then the output is a vector in R3. We have these component functions here. And the second example has much more complicated component functions than the first one does. So you would expect it to have some more complicated properties. Um, but to start with, let's just think a little bit about some inputs and some outputs. And so I'm just going to evaluate this first vector valued function at some different values of t. Uh, and just to kind of think about what, what exactly is going on here. So a good number to try to plug in in any vector valued function, if you can, uh, is 0. And we can plug in 0 here. So when we plug in 0, this is put, telling us put in t equals 0 everywhere we see that. So I'll have 3 times 0 squared, which will be 0, and negative 2 times 0, which is 0. And then this last component is always going to be 4, no matter what t is. Um, and then maybe some positive and some negative values of t, just to kind of get a sense of uh, if those behave differently. So I'll just pick some very easy numbers to plug in here. So t equals 1, uh, 3 times 1 squared is 3, negative 2 times 1 is negative 2, and then that third component is always 4 on this one. And let's do r of negative 1. So again, being careful here when you square that negative 1 is positive 1 times 3 will be 3, and then negative 2 times negative 1 will be positive 2 and 4. So I've just got some different input and output things here. I could graph some of those vectors if I wanted to graph some of those vectors. We'll actually look at some graphs of vector valued functions in some later videos. But um, this one, I'm just going to graph some of those. And so I just made a little XYZ coordinate system here. Uh, I need to scale off my axes so that I can graph these. Uh, in the Z direction, I need at least four. Uh, in the X direction, I've got my positive X axis coming out. I need at least three. And in my Y direction, I need negative two to two. Uh, if I don't label my axes, remember they would just be as, as we ordinarily expect them to be. So if I want to graph these vectors here, uh, we'll just kind of get a sense of those. So this R of zero is zero, zero, four. If there's not a compelling reason to put that vector somewhere else, we'll put it in standard position with its tail at the origin. So tail at the origin and then just going up four units. So there's R of zero. R of one would be out three, left two, and up four. So I'm just moving out three and then left two spots and then using my scale of four here to kind of put where that terminal point would be. So again, tail at the origin, out three, left two, up four would be my terminal point there. And then R of negative one, out three, right two, and up four. And because of the way I drew my axes here, it's kind of almost in the same line of sight as my Z axis. So it's a little hard to see that one coming right out at us. But one thing you might notice about graphing these is that when you think about an ordinary function like Y equals X squared, and you graph that function, uh, you've got a place for your input axis and your output axis. So, for example, when you input 2 and you get out 4, you can graph that as an ordered pair to 4, and you can see both the input and the output on your graph here. But on these kinds of graphs, I need three dimensions just to graph the outputs, which means there's no axis left, no place left to put the inputs here. So that'll be relevant when we look at graphing these vector valued functions that because you need so many dimensions just to graph the outputs that you really don't graph them in exactly the same way that you graph ordinary functions. Um, all right, so another relevant thing to think about with any kind of vector valued function would be its domain. And I've plugged in some values here and so we got outputs. Each value that I plugged in for t got one output vector to that input t value. And so we can see here that these numbers would all be part of my domain. These vectors would all be part of my range. 
for this vector valued function. And so when we talk about the domain of the function overall, though, we want to think about all the possible inputs for this function. So for this function here, just looking at those component functions and thinking about what you know about domain back from algebra uh, prior to calculus even, uh, there's no functions here that would require any restrictions on the domain. So for this function, our domain would be all real numbers, all of the set of real numbers. You could write that in interval notation if you want. When you think about the range, uh, the range is some subset of vectors in R3, uh, but not all the vectors in R3. So the range is some set of vectors in R3. Uh, notice that all of my output vectors will always have four in that third component, so it's certainly not all vectors in R3. The zero vector, for example, is not an output vector. And the other thing that's true is that my i and j components have to have some specific relationship to each other. So for example, 1, 1, 4 is not a possible output vector here because there's not a t value I could plug in that would give me 1 and 1 in both of these components. So the range is some subset of vectors in R3. Uh, I've drawn three of those vectors, but it's not all vectors in R3. When we look uh, in some later videos at some graphs of vector-valued functions, we might be able to make a better description here about what exactly is the range of these vectors for this vector-valued function. All right, for this second example here, uh, I'm not going to do quite as much as I did with the first one. Uh, I do want to think about domain and maybe do some input and output for that. All right, so for this one, because my component functions are a little more complicated, uh, we can think about these component functions really just in terms of how you would think about functions from algebra and thinking about any domain restrictions that would occur based on any of these component functions. So for this first component function, I have a logarithm of some expression, and you should know from algebra that logarithm functions require the input to be a positive number. So this expression inside the logarithm function needs to be greater than zero. Because of the square, I'm not ever going to have any negatives inside that logarithm, even if I put a negative number in for t, because when I square it, that will make that expression positive. We won't have to worry about any negatives there but I will need to avoid zero here. So this first component function is going to force a restriction that t cannot equal zero. Generally, when you think about a logarithm, you want that expression in there to be positive. But because of the square, we don't have to worry about the negative part. We really only have to worry about zero. So that first component function forces a restriction that t cannot be zero. If we look at this second component function, this inverse trig function, all of those inverse trig functions have different restrictions in terms of their domain. Um, for cosine inverse, if you forget what the restriction is, just think about the cosine function. So the outputs of the cosine function are between negative 1 and 1, which means the inputs for the cosine inverse function have to be between negative 1 and 1. So when I think about this here, uh, the inputs for the inverse cosine function which are represented by t over 2, have to be between negative 1 and 1. So I just set up that inequality, thinking about that. And then if I solve for t, uh, you see that you'll end up with t values between negative 2 and 2. And so that restriction comes from the second component function. The last component function here with the radical, if I want vectors in Rn and not imaginary numbers for components of vectors, then I need to make sure that what I put in here is not going to result in a negative under the radical. So I need this expression under the radical to be greater than or equal to zero. So all of that is really some trig for the tr inverse trig function and algebra for these other two uh, functions, uh, thinking about domain. Uh, what is a little different here, as opposed to whatever you did in trig or algebra, is kind of putting that all together and realizing that when you put in a number into a vector-valued function for t, whatever number you put in for t, you're putting that same number into all of the component functions in place of t. 
So any restrictions that I get from one component are going to also have to be restrictions for the other component functions. All right, so when I think about for this one, kind of tying together all three of these restrictions that I got, different ones from each component function, and then thinking about what the domain is, remember that the domain is what t can be, what are the possible inputs for this function. Uh, we can see that this says t has to be between negative 2 and 2, but this restricts us to just t values greater than or equal to negative 1. So between these two, I get a restriction that t is uh, between negative 1 and 2. And then I need to remember to exclude 0 from this restriction over here. So for this one, uh, our domain would be uh, negative 1 to 0. I've used interval notation here. And then 0 to 2. All right, for that one for the domain. The range is a lot more complicated for this one. We could certainly do some uh, plugging in some values and get some outputs for that if we want, get some output vectors. But really, I just want to focus on domain for this one. We'll look at uh, this example and then some other examples for graphs and talk a little bit more about range in those videos.